It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 57, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Drew Rivers began farming in 1983 with her farmer, Paul Mueller, in Northern California's Cape Valley. Since that time, Full Belly Farm has grown to over 200 acres of vegetables, with still more acres devoted to flowers, animals, fruits, nuts, and even grains. Oh, and they've recently gotten into value-added products as well. All of this is marketed to farmer's markets, CSA customers, and wholesale customers in the Bay Area, Davis, and Sacramento. Full Belly Farm has also grown in the number of people involved, not just acres. And when I talk about people, I'm not just talking about their intern program or their employees, although we do dig into how Full Belly has created a renowned and very successful internship program and an environment that fosters fantastic employee retention. Full Belly's ownership has also grown with an early partnership with Judith Redmond and Andrew Brait, as well as a more recent expansion to include some of Drew and Paul's children. Drew shares about why their partnership has worked, the return of all four of her children to the farm, managing a wide diversity of enterprises, and the renowned Hose Down Harvest Festival. I had a lot of fun talking to Drew. I think you're going to enjoy this episode just as much as I did. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Vermont Compost, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality composts and compost-based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. Bandwidth for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is provided by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on farm. Gear-driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSAmerica.com. Drew Rivers, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Great. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to have you on the show. You were you were actually one of the first people that came up from our very early guests to, who said, you've got to get Drew on the show. So thank you so much for making the time to be here today. Yeah, I'm excited. So could we start off by having you tell us about Full Belly Farm? And I, I feel like that's one of those questions, like, just tell us about Full Belly Farm, because you guys are so big and so diversified and have so many different aspects. I'm sure you'll be able to sum it all up in about 30 seconds, right? <laughs> we'll see where we go. <laughs> yeah, so um, our farm is uh, located in Northern California, beautiful little valley called the Cape Hay Valley, uh, which is about 30 miles long. Uh, it's a, a valley that's off the main part of the Sacramento Valley. Um, we are about 400 acres of CCOS certified ground. And on that 400 acres, we grow probably 100 or plus um, of different things. So um, yes, we have become very diversified. We've been farming here since 1984. And um, one of the things that's interesting is just how our farm is owned and operated is we're actually started for the last um, 30 years as a partnership of four people, and now we have actually uh, moved into becoming a corporation so that our children can now become part of the farm with us. So um, that's one thing that makes us a little bit unique. Um, the other thing is, is just that we, we have sort of all these different components of the farm. Uh, we're mostly uh, fresh market vegetables, but we also do flowers. We have an animal component to the farm, fruits, nuts. Uh, we're diversifying into grains. So it's a kind of a big farm of a lot of small things is how we kind of put it. And um, so we have many different projects going on all the time. Um, I'm one of the four original owners of the farm. My husband and I and our four children are now all back here farming with us, which is kind of another unique aspect of our sort of bringing on the next generation. So, wow. And you said how many how many of the next generation are farming with the four of you who are who are the owners of the farm? So my husband and I have four children, and um, all four of them are presently back here at the farm uh, Holy working bucket. with us. So that makes it really cool for us. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And what year did you guys start Full Belly Farm? 
So we started, we moved to the, our present land in 1984 um, with one child and no money. Um, we moved to a, a piece of very neglected property that was about 110 acres. And we actually, my husband and I started the farm um, and we were renting for the first five years. We rented the property with kind of always a little hope to own it. And then it actually did come up for sale and we decided that we weren't really convinced that the traditional American farm model of farming was, was going to work because we were really both wanting to farm full time, not have to have jobs off the farm. So we asked another couple to come and join us as partners at that point. And that was in 1990. And um, since then, we've actually been a partnership of um, four people. And then last year, my son and his wife joined us also. So, um, yeah, the farm has been here for now 30, almost 32 years. So we're well established. Wow. <laughs> and when we think of California farming, um, I mean, you guys tend to do things, especially around vegetables, on a much larger scale than what we do them here in the upper Midwest. How how many acres of vegetables do you guys have? So all in all, um, it's probably 150 to 200 acres of, of vegetables. I mean, one of the unique things about this area is that we can be harvesting something 365 days of the year, and we are year-round production. So there's never a time when we have all of those acres in production altogether, but it's staggered around, you know, throughout the year uh, with our summer, spring, <laughs> fall, and winter production. So, but it's about 250, 200 plus acres of vegetables. Wow, that's that's a lot of vegetables. <laughs> yeah, it keeps us busy, yeah, for sure. <laughs> And, and what are your outlets for your produce? So our marketing strategy has really um, developed over the 32 years. We originally started more wholesaling, and then um, about 20 years ago, we started a CSA. So we currently have a 1,200-member CSA that we deliver to uh, about 50 weeks of the year. Um, and then we also do farmers markets in the Bay Area. We have three really great markets that we go to. Um, and those two outlets, the CSA and our farmers market, account for about uh, 40% of our income. And the other 60% is um, wholesale and direct to store deliveries. We also deliver to about 30 different restaurants. Um, so Kind of that rest of the pie, the sixty percent is a mix of wholesale and direct to um, store sales. So, can you tell me a little bit more about how your CSA is structured? I mean, you said uh, twelve hundred members. Is that twelve hundred boxes going off the farm every week? Yeah, it's about a thousand boxes every week that go off the farm. Um, so we're always planting and planning um, with that in mind. Um, like I said, we we do deliver almost fifty weeks out of the year, so we take a, a, a brief break in December from delivering boxes. But other than that, we're delivering about a thousand boxes a week. So that means, you know, planning for a thousand bunches of kale every week and a thousand bunches of carrots. So, um, you know, our planning has to be pretty good to keep the boxes diversified, keep our CSA members really happy. Uh, we started uh, the box program about 20 years ago um, and with about 50 members. And it was just kind of at the beginning of the CSA, a boon, and we uh, were, you know, really 
so happy to make that happen um, as people who had been selling wholesale, getting that direct to farmer feedback was so great and really getting to know a lot of our customers. Some of them have continued on for the whole 20 years, which is really cool. A lot of the children um, of CSA members grew up with our vegetables their whole life. So that makes you feel really good as a farmer. So. That's really awesome. I love that. I mean, it's 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 such a rewarding part. I think of the CSA when when it's really working right is getting those sorts of long term interactions with your customers. Yep, and we you know we have many different add ons that people can get now. I mean, we're almost uh, could be almost a full diet CSA um, because we do offer uh, meat shares from our animal. Uh, program and we have flowers that people can add on as an extra for um, for their houses and so yeah it's really fun they can add on big boxes of tomatoes if they want to for canning and um, so we've tried to diversify it as much as possible our farm is you know one of the few left that really only uses product from our farm um, we don't buy in other vegetables from anywhere else so um, we really are a true farm CSA um, in that the kind of historical context of the CSA and I and I love I'm I'm, I'm actually looking at at your website and what it says is in this week's farm box and I, I love the fact that you've got rutabagas and oranges yeah like what are, what are, you know here <laughs> sit, sitting here in wisconsin that looks pretty appealing we are so spoiled yeah we're kind of right on the cusp of, of being able to grow citrus um we do occasionally get a freeze but uh, this year has been beautiful and the oranges are super sweet so yeah we are spoiled rotten compared to the midwest and all of those oranges and almonds and lemons, those are all coming off of your farm as well, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We um, we have a, a very big uh, nut uh, diversification for the farm. We, we have about 40 acres of almonds, and we also do about 12 acres of walnuts. Uh, we have some uh, pe- pecans that we're starting with now. So having the nuts has been a really nice thing as a sort of added protein. Uh, we we add we don't actually put the nuts in the CSA boxes very often, but people can add them on as an extra item. So people really appreciate having that as um, a, an add-on. So tell me a little bit about how that works with the CSA then. So folks get a get a basic box then that might be, again, the beets, the broccoli, the carrots, the oranges, the rutabagas that I see listed. And then folks can place an order for extra stuff? That's right. Our box, we're kind of old school, which some people love and then other people don't love. But um, we are old school in that it, we make the decisions from the farm point of view, what to put in the box uh, each week. We don't let people customize their box. Um, That just gets really crazy for us. And also, one of the points of the CSA is for people to be eating really seasonally um, and really sort of helping the farm, um, you know, be able to in the production of, of what's happening that week. So we make the decision about what goes in the box each week. Um, but we do have a list of other items that people can add on. The basic box is usually about eight or nine different items. Uh, and yeah, like you say, we always try and have some sort of fruit in the box. In the wind, in the summer, we really focus on a lot of melons. We do peaches and apricots. And other fun fruits like mulberries and um, strawberries. So they get oh, quite a few, um, div- quite a lot of diversification in fruit as well. Um, but then also usually a pretty strong uh, component of vegetables. Right now there's a lot of greens in the box, a lot of root vegetables in the winter. In the summer it tends to be a lot of tomatoes, peppers, eggplants. Um, and then, again, lots of beautiful melons. So that's the basic box, and then people can add on. 
And what kind of volume is is the box? I see you guys have this really nice printed. I mean, it's a, a very well branded box that's you know clearly belongs to Full Belly Farm. How big is that? The box is um, well in produce terms, it's about the size of a normal squash box. Um, and yeah, it, it usually, it, well, the weight of the box varies tremendously. Winter, the boxes tend to be a little lighter because there's lots of greens like chard and spinach and mixed um, salad greens. In the summer, it tends to be pretty heavy with melon, tomatoes, and sort of items that tend to weigh a lot more. But I, I, wager to say it runs from anywhere from 10 to 20, even 20 pounds per box. Okay. Okay. And, and I'm really impressed by the diversity of stuff that you're managing there. I mean, you know, a couple hundred acres of vegetables is enough all by itself, but then you add in the, the fruit and then the nuts. And I, and I think, I mean, I probably know just enough about this to be really dangerous, but I think that growing nuts is quite a bit different than growing fruit. And then you've added in the flowers as well, plus the sheep and the and the laying hens. How do you guys manage all of that? Oh gosh, it's kind of like a big ballet dance every single day. That some days is very well choreographed and others not. But um, we do have different teams on the farm that really focus on. Uh, different areas. So um, the vegetables are, again, it's kind of our main focus, but we also have an orchard crew that manages our uh, all the fruit. Uh, we also have a nut manager, um, usually it's my husband, but can also be other people if there's time. Um, animals are something that I really focus a lot on along with my son. Um, we do a lot of the, the sheep production and we also have about 1,200 laying hens that um, to add into the mix and um, some pigs that we also raise for for pork. So the animal component is sort of uh, one of the things that I help manage. Um, the flowers is another one of the things that I do here at the farm. We do about 10 acres of cut flowers every year. So that goes not only to our wholesale account but also to our CSA. And people are really sort of starting to appreciate to have organic certified organic flowers, um, as well as the food that they eat. So the flowers have really become a great program for us as well. So yeah, every day is a really um, big challenge to try and get everything done. Today, we're looking at a potential rain, which in California is very exciting right now. So as you can imagine, everyone's scrambling around, uh, vying for tractors to get things done. But we we do manage. We somehow manage to pull it off every day. Well, so give me an idea about that. How many tractors does it take to run a farm your size? Oh, my gosh. Uh, right now, I think we're up to about 17 different tractors. Um, and, you know, they all have various functions. We've got several tractors for cultivating, several for doing groundwork. We've got several orchard tractors. So, yeah, um, but on a day like today, everybody is sort of um, trying to get out there first to get the tractor that they need for planting or for working beds to get things ready. Um, but, yeah, I think we're, I, I don't know, we may even be over 17 or 18 at this point. Um, the tractors are um, really, really valuable, but I do want to just also talk a little bit about the fact that um, we are not doing this alone. Our our labor force is really a wonderful, um, amazing group of people that many of them who have worked here for 25, 30 years. Um, we have about 80 full-time people um, and, you know, they're all doing just amazing, a lot of handwork. Uh, all of our fields, all of our produce is picked by hand. We do very little mechanical harvest. So our um, our labor force is just an amazing, 
a very important component um, of the farm as well. Where do you draw most of those 80 workers from? Um, a lot of them are local. Uh, one thing that's really fun is that a lot of them now are next generation. Also, we had an original crew that started working with us back in 1984, and now a lot of their kids have come on to help out as well. So we we have probably the majority of the crew lives within um, 30 miles of the farm and comes in daily. Um, Right now, you know, work starting at uh, 7 and summer, it starts to start at 6 and even 5.30 when it gets really hot. So our labor um, force really is sort of a local force and also just really um, a wonderful part of our family as well. And it's it's interesting to me that as you go around the country, it's it's not uncommon to run into farmers who did work formerly at Full Belly Farm. In fact, we just did an interview last week with Emily Oakley, who was a former <laughs> employee of yours. And I've, I've done a lot of work personally with Jack Hedin at, uh, at Featherstone Farm here in Minnesota, uh, who I know spent some time with you guys. Um, is and, and you guys have a really good reputation, and, and obviously it's a well-deserved reputation if you have people that have been with you for 20 years. Yeah. What's the secret to that? How do you guys make that work? Well, one of the things that you're referring to is our internship program, which um, is really one of the things we're really proud of. I mean, it's one thing to grow vegetables. It's another to grow new farmers, and I think... When we first started the farm, we realized that um, that was really a responsibility that we had to the country and the world and at large was to continue to nurture and to educate new farmers. So we began our internship program um, 30 years ago, actually, right when we started, we got our first interns and it's developed into just one of the most rewarding and amazing parts of what we do here. Uh, we usually have five interns. Uh, they all stay a year with us. Um, they do everything from getting up at three in the morning to go to the farmer's market with us, to hoeing, to even getting involved in our community. So this is just something that um, we point to as something that all farmers should be doing because, well, as you know and probably have had on your program before, I mean, we're losing farmers just at a really alarming rate. And um, we just need to keep that next generation always coming on as new farmers. So over the years, we probably had 300 different interns uh, come and stay with us. And I think we've, we have done a really fun count that maybe a success rate of about 30% have gone on to become actual farm owners and farming. The rest have all gone on to other amazing things. We keep in contact with many of them still. And, you know, they've, also become some of our best friends over the years, Jack in particular, his family. Um, in fact, one of his children was born here at the farm. So, um, you know, our relationship with those people is sort of n never ending, which is really so wonderful. Um, and we have been now interns all over the world, actually. Um, some people had come from Germany, and now we do an internship with uh, program through Japan. Um, so every year we have a Japanese intern here and many of them go back to their countries and are just so excited about farming. So that is one thing that I just can't say enough good things about that. Um, and I just feel like it's our, like I said, our responsibility and our really our sort of future to um, keep the new farmers alive. How do you differentiate the ways that you interact with employees versus versus your interns? Is there, I mean, because you've got the internship program and then you've got these, you know, 80 full-time employees, 
it, it's obviously clearly a it's its own track. So are you guys providing like an education program for the interns or is there a way that they're rotating through tasks that the rest of your workers aren't? Yeah, I mean, our interns, well, first of all, they live here. So they become kind of an integral part of some of the farm jobs that uh, are, you know, done at different times of the day that our regular day crew isn't like, for instance, right now we're in the middle of lambing with our sheep. And so I have our interns helping me get up at three in the morning to check the sheep. Um, you know, so they're really doing some of that chores that many farmers have to do that are outside of a normal work day as well. Um, but they, they rotate around a lot of the jobs that, um, you know, that our, our day crew does, uh, as well, but they kind of get a little bit of a flavor of it all during the year that they're here. Um, they go to the farmer's market with us, which is a very big educational experience for, for them. Um, they, you know, learn how to drive the truck and they, um, learn how to interact with customers. We try as much as possible to also teach a little bit about the business side of the farm, too, um, because a lot of them leave going, wow, I learned how to do, drive a tractor, but I never really actually learned all the ins and outs of your whole office and payroll and things like that. So, um, you know, we try and get them a little taste of everything while they're here. Um but a lot of them actually work daily in and out with our crew. Um, one of the things that most of them love is that much, much of our crew is Spanish speaking. And so they get an added bonus of learning Spanish while they're here. So yeah, there's just so many variables and so many fun things that they get to do while they're here. And tell me about your interactions with your full-time crew. Again, we said, you're keeping people on for 20 years. You're clearly doing something right and something that is, I think, different than what a lot of farmers must be doing because that's not normal. <laughs> well, uh, honestly, we spend a lot of time um, sort of nurturing our crew. And, uh, it, you know, it's an, a huge responsibility. We just feel like their livelihood is our livelihood and vice versa. So, that maybe just right off the bat um, gives you a little bit of an indication of our sort of dedication to them. We we do a free food policy for our crew where they can take home um, food that we have that's um, available all year round. Um, we have a, a great medical program, insurance, medical insurance program for all of our crew members. Um, we do quarterly uh, meals where we are introducing new food that maybe they wouldn't have eaten. One of our crew members had worked here for 20 years and actually never tried beets. And so we made a <laughs> beautiful lunch um, and it included, you know, cooked beets. And he'd been picking beets for the last 20 years but never tried them. And so things like that, we, we try to introduce um, good diet program for our crew members that might otherwise not have that opportunity. Um, we've even provided loans for some of our of crew to buy housing in the area. So we do have a very, very strong relationship with our crew. Um, and you know, it's also something that we feel really good about. You mentioned having extremely early starts in the summertime to deal with the the afternoon heat are what kind of hours do you guys typically work on the farm or does your crew typically work yeah, on the farm? I mean typically we try and keep a 10 hour day in the summer um we sometimes work overtime um in the summer but we also right now in the winter January February can be more like an eight hour day um we do. We keep very, very careful track of heat. I mean, our weather here can get to be 110 frequently in July and August. So we have to be super careful about 
um, heat concerns with our crew. We're always posting temperatures and making sure everybody's really safe during the summer. But yeah, I mean, our ideal would be a 10 hour day for our crew. Of course, then, you know, us owners are often working 16 hours a day. So um, that's just the life of farming, though. And it's it's interesting to me that even at your guys' scale, you're still finding yourself working those 16-hour days. Yeah, I mean, a little bit of it is that we're all kind of A-type personalities. Um, you know, we are super, uh, we love our farm and we love our work, uh, probably um, more importantly. And, you know, we just feel like we just want it to work so badly. It's really great. Um just talk a little bit about the fact that our kids all went away to college um, and sort of slowly all trickled back to the farm. I think it's because the food is so good, honestly. But um, <laughs> but I do, you know, I think they also um, got ingrained with a love for the land and for the the sort of work ethic that we have and we all love to work and we um, probably get a little bit driven driven crazy by it at times, but um, they all have come back and have taken up really important positions um, at the farm. One of our sons and his wife are doing, um, uh, have built a beautiful certified kitchen. So now we're doing value added things with our food that we weren't able to do before, making jams and jellies and sauces, and they're also doing farm dinners. Um, so that's a really fun uh, new component, but also important, you know, in thinking about like, waste and things like that, but just, you know, things that we can now produce here that um, we maybe couldn't have before. Uh, also, just Our whole, uh, our other daughter, um, one of our other daughters, Hallie, is back here doing a whole educational component of the farm. Um, We do a lot of school school visits. We probably have over 5,000 people visit the farm every year um, on a regular basis. Um, So she is running that whole program for us, doing tours, um, having overnight uh, visits with school kids. Um, so our other son is doing the ad, really working with me, um, with his uh, wife to be on um, the animal component of the farm, really taking that to a new level. And our youngest daughter just returned, and she is taking our flower program over and just doing an amazing job with bringing sort of. Uh, more value to the flowers doing weddings and events and yeah, really taking it to a great new, new spot. So yeah, it's so fun to have them involved and taking a little bit of pressure off the older generation. And what's the, what's the age range of your kids? Um, 32 to 24. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And do they still, I mean, do they still squabble in the way that siblings do, or have they all grown out of that? I think they've grown out of it. Um, you know, oh my gosh, there's times when they all revert back to, uh, you know, five through ten again. But um, they had a crazy life growing up here. Um, you know, I was super busy as a full-time farming mom um, and they spent a lot of time playing out in the fields with me and working in the packing shed. So sometimes I kind of scratch my head why they decided to come back. But um, like I say, it's probably because the food's really yummy. <laughs> <laughs> that's just, I, I, I just think that's so great. Congratulations. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And I, I have, you know, no expectations of it lasting forever. But if it did, that sure would be cool. Yeah. Now, you talked at the outset about how you had begun the farm as a, well, you'd begun the farm just as you and Paul. So when you brought in Judith and Andrew, um, you guys formed a formal partnership. And that now you've actually moved on to to form a corporation so that you can bring your kids in as they're as they're interested in and in, in wanting to do that. 
Can you tell me a little bit more about about that process? I mean, I find that that I think it's really interesting that you've yeah. come up with some ownership structures that actually really facilitate the farm moving forward. Yeah, I um, you know it's certainly been you know a a, a long term sort of process of working through details. Our original partnership agreement that we came up with about 26 years ago was one of the most simple, basic, easy to use partnership agreements that um, really I've ever seen. And then or since it worked so well for 25 years um, as or 28 years as a a working document that we often referred to. We did actually have one one person leave and it worked perfectly um, and smoothly to have that transition happen. And then we use that document also to sort of guide us in um, working out of sort of our shareholder agreement that the the basic thing about that is how do we do a buy in and buy out program um and so we spent probably the last two years um in meetings occasionally talking about that you know reading new things and then talking about it more and finally um have come up with a really great working document that we feel really comfortable with, um, you know, but it was it was definitely a pro, you know a work in progress for several years before we actually finalized it. Um, but I think it's a really good, healthy way to have our farm structured now. I have to admit that I was kind of kicking my heels because I hate the word corporation, um, but I do now see the value of it as a way for the next generation or other people to join us as part owners of the farm um, without having to buy in completely, but we can do smaller share ownership. So um, I'm really excited about it. Um, so I'd be really interested now in, if you don't mind, um, just telling us some of the details of that of that partnership agreement. You said that it uh, I mean, because I think a lot, a lot of my listeners, that might be more the place where they would be. And I, so I'd like to start there. But you mentioned you had somebody leave, and it actually worked really smoothly. What was it about the agreement that made it work smoothly? Oh gosh, I think the main thing is that it's very simple. There, um, it's not written. The partnership agreement is not written in sort of legal legalese. You know, it, it's it's um, very clear cut. Um, you know, this is what happens and this is how you do it if this happens. Um, so it's a very simple formula to follow. Uh, we did have a, a, one of our original partners decide that he really wanted to move somewhere else and wanted to get um, bought out from our business. And so he, um, we, and it was very friendly and we were able to do that very smoothly with our partnership. Um, you know, one of the, the, the sort of funny things we talk about in our partnership agreement are the, the, the D's, which is death or divorce, dismemberment. I mean, we kind of, you know, laugh about that, but those are the kind of things that you really need to kind of consider when you're, um, when you're making this agreement, but, and some of it's just not as complicated as you might think. So, um, I, I don't really know if I can go into specific details, but I just want to encourage people to sort of make things as simple, as straightforward, as understandable as possible when you do make up some sort of partnership agreement. Would you say that the same thing is true about an incorporation agreement as well? That, yeah. That keeping it in that plain language and kind of focusing on the real nuts and bolts? Yes, exactly. And, um, you know, the, the corporation is a... Uh, the language is a little bit more complicated um, just because there are things that you have to include uh, legally um, that, uh, you know, with a, a, a corporate papers than... Um, and we did have to in our partnership agreement. But um, again, trying to keep it as simple as sort of, we actually drew so many diagrams, like what if 
this happened or you know we even drew stick figures of of all of us like and if this person got married how does that work <laughs> and so um yeah, we had lots of fun drawing cartoon characters to make sure that we had it all figured out <laughs> well and i wonder if some of that was you i mean you talk about this as being a, a not an odious process and usually those kinds of negotiations just aren't a whole lot of fun and it sounds like you guys found a way to make it fun and interesting doing things like cartoon characters. Yeah, I think that that was fun. I mean, there I'm, I don't want to make it sound like it was all just fun and games, but I think the other thing is because we are all so sort of committed to our farm, we would, you know, spend spend hours and days and weeks not talking about it and thinking through it and then coming back together um, for another meeting and then going another few weeks. So it did take us a while to actually come up with a lot of the, the language that we needed, but um, we did um, finally, finally resolve it all. And so I think it, 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 it was a, not a real contentious process, honestly. <laughs> Do each of the members of the partnership or, or the corporation now really, do all of you have your different specified roles and responsibilities on the farm? Yeah, I mean, most of those are actually, you know, sort of unwritten. Um, you know, we have all just taken on responsibilities um, that we somewhat enjoy, some, you know, like I really love working with the animals. And so I have taken on that responsibility. Um, Andrew, our, our partner, Andrew is just an amazing um, tomato grower. And so he has, got, you know, he's taken our tomato program that we do, fresh market tomatoes and heirloom tomatoes to this amazing level um, where they are, are definitely our number one crop. So, yeah, our roles have sort of developed over the last 25 years, but they also do include things that we are really good at and that we sort of are, you know, our strengths lie in certain areas. And really, one of, I, I, I can't say enough about our partnership um, or our community aspect of our farm. Uh, I, I do kind of want to just say that I think the model of the single family farm is a little bit defunct now in, in this country. It's really, really hard to do, um, to, you know, just be a single family with children and farm full time and make it all work. And, and I think we all saw a lot of failures 20, 30 years ago in that model. Um, and, you know, with our group of people that are here now, um, the four of us and now six of us, you know, we are able to take vacations occasionally and we're able to do some of the things that we pursue, some things that we really want to do besides just working 20 hours a day. So, you know, I feel like I, I want to encourage people to think a little bit outside the box of land ownership and business ownership when you're thinking of farming, um, because there are fun models that can help make it happen and make it profitable and, and, you know, really more enjoyable too. Drew, that seems like a really good spot for us to stop and take a break and get a word from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back. Okay. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, makers of Fort V and Fort Light potting mixes. When you buy potting mix from Vermont Compost Company, you're not just buying an input. You're joining a community of growers across the United States. And like the best inputs and the best communities, you're getting a product and a community that really have your back. Vermont Compost Company has been committed to helping farmers make money by growing great transplants for over 20 years. If you've got questions or need help with your transplants, whether you've got questions about watering, temperatures, troubleshooting, growing conundrums, you can call them up and you can actually talk to Carl Hammer, the founder and owner of the company. And Carl knows his stuff. And about that community, Vermont Compost keeps track of who gets every batch of potting soil they create. And because Vermont Compost deals directly with growers without going through a distributor, they know who's using their potting soils and how they're using them. Vermont Compost Company knows, like I do, that organic growers are some of the best people on the planet. They're proud to be part of that community. Taking care of growers by taking care of transplants since 1992. VermontCompost.com. 
Bandwidth for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is provided by BCS America. A BCS two-wheel tractor is the only power equipment a market gardener will need with PTO-driven attachments like the rototiller, flail mower, power harrow, rotary plow, snow thrower, log splitter, and more. You name it, and you can probably run it with a versatile BCS two-wheel tractor. The first time I used a rototiller way back in 1991, it was mounted to a BCS two-wheel tractor, and it spoiled me for life. When you get behind a BCS, you can tell that it's built to the same commercial standards as four-wheeled farm tractors. I've used other tillers and mowers, and I spent most of the time when I was using them thinking of how much easier it would be with a BCS. On my own farm, we went through a number of so-called solutions before we finally got smart and bought one for ourselves. Even though we owned a four-wheel tractor to manage our 20 acres of vegetables, the BCS tackled jobs that we couldn't do with the larger machine, from mowing steep slopes and around trees to working on our high tunnels. Check out bcsamerica.com to see the full lineup of tractors and attachments. All right, and we're back with Drew Rivers from Full Belly Farm. Drew, you were just talking before the break about about the process of partnerships and corporations and all of the conversations that you guys had around that. And, and it sort of makes me think that, you know, the, the, the group of you must be kind of like this big family. I mean, you know, you look at the pictures of, of you and, and Paul and, and Judith on the website, you guys are all, I mean, you're clearly very in tune with each other, but it must also have been really interesting to be raising a family on the farm at the same time that you were kind of dealing with all of these other relationships and then the pressures of the growing business. And I'm, I'm interested how you went about integrating your, your four children, integrating your family life into the rest of the life of the farm. Yeah. I mean, I, I, there's certainly been challenges now I'm kind of in the, 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 I've kind of gone through some of the more challenging younger years. Um, I think I always, as a woman who really, really wanted to farm full time um, and also have a family, um, there are certain things that you, you know, have to just let go of. Well, clean house number one, but um, <laughs> you know, always having things super organized, never. Um, but our our kids are really a big part of our our farm as they grew up. Um, we always, they came to the farmer's markets with us. So um, learning math was a, a great skill that they all got at an early age. Um, we often had, you know, many of them uh, bundled into the truck together at three o'clock in the morning. And I often worried that, um, you know, was I being a good mom? Um, but now in retrospect and, you know, seeing things that they've since written or told their friends about, I think one of their, you know, their the, their most favorite memories were some some of the ones that where I really was like, gosh, am I doing the right thing? So um, I I feel like integrating the kids is just such an important thing for. Uh, I since have you know talked to a lot of new mothers who are farming and and wanting to just let them know that uh, what I feel now is that for the most important thing for kids is to see their parents at work. Um, I know I grew up in a, in a family where I actually never knew what my dad did or I knew what my mom did because she worked in a hospital. But I, I feel like, you know, one of the most valuable things was to see as a early age exactly what your parents did. Um, they were out, we were out weeding, we were out packing vegetables and they were always on our back in a, in a backpack or, you know, scampering around the packing shed um, in boxes with us and playing, but they could, we were there. We knew exactly where they were and, and vice versa. So, um, you know, there's just this, this sort of very visible um, work ethics that they were brought up with and they knew wh that we had to work really hard to make the farm work. Um, and so I think even in, in their high school years, they were all very involved with uh, Future Farmers of America and the 4-H. Um, and we always tried to really stress that farming was, you know, just a, a great, a really great vocation. Um, it's, it's a passion. And uh, I think that's a great thing for kids to see. Um, and so now it's really fun for me to see that they are as passionate about the farm, if not more um, than I am. So it's, it's just, I think that 
as parents, we have to let go of some of the conceived notions that our kids should be, you know, uh, playing soccer every weekend or uh, (laughs) some of the things that we think they should be doing. But really, it's so fun for them to be with their parents. So, yeah, I think that's a great part of growing up on the farm and they all have really fond memories of it. So it doesn't sound like you grew up on the farm. Did Paul grow up on the farm? Uh, Yeah, I grew up actually in Vermont in a pretty rural area, but not actually farming. Um, Paul grew up in um, on a dairy farm in San Jose, downtown San Jose, California, the last dairy farm uh, to be uh, in existence in the city. Um, Their farm was actually eventually shut out by the city uh, because of um, complaints by neighbors. And so they moved, um, his family moved to a more rural area up near where we live now um, and are continuing, they continue to farm. So yes, Paul did grow up on a pretty, a very um, active, diversified dairy farm where they grew um, all the hay and feed for their animals as well. Interesting to me that you ended up being the one who's primarily involved with the livestock. (laughs) Oh, he hates the cows. I milk the (laughs) cow every day, Chris. Yeah, no, he will will have nothing to do with the cows. (laughs) That's what growing up on a dairy farm will do, I guess. I do find as I as I as I look for some of the common themes with with farmers that some of the best vegetable farmers used to be dairy farmers at some point in their life. You know that that somehow that I think almost that that regular rhythm that that whole the cows aren't going to wait to get milked thing uh, really uh, contributes to kind of really feeling the rhythms and the and the uh, the essence of timeliness in the farming operation. Well, growing up on a dairy farm is one of the most difficult. I mean, it's like it is a 365 day a year job. There's no going away. Um and you know, my my heart goes out to <laughs> all dairy farmers. It's a huge job. Um and you know, animals are so different than vegetables. There's not, you know, you can't just go away for a day. They have, they really need you every single day. So yeah, I think I agree with you. It, it instills in all people that work on dairy farms, an incredible commitment, but also just sort of, you know, the need to be punctual and need to be there constantly. And I guess if you, if you want one thing to make vegetable farming look easy, it would be dairy farming. <laughs> Exactly. That's a good point. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Now, obviously, in your in your diversified operation, I mean, you're clearly not rotating the nuts through with the vegetables. But are the the sheep and the laying hens and the and the flowers are those all integrated with the rest of the vegetable operation? Yeah. So we do um, we do a very complex sort of the same with our crew, the same with our animals, with the kind of ballet dance of animals around the farm. We do rotate the sheep, are rotated around all of our cropland. Um, they're always going into fields that we're finished with, um, like a broccoli field right now that we're done with. They'll go in and eat down all the broccoli. Um, melons, they love melon, old melon fields, and they love uh, old sweet corn field. So the sheep are really actually have become an incredibly important part of the complexity and diversity of the farm. Um, we use electric fencing for moving them um, all around, and we've we've got we've got a very complex computer system where we can track where they've been um, and, you know, then where, how long before we can harvest out of that field when we're, we're replanting. So it's it's great. And the chickens are, are in the same thing. They're not so much out in the crop fields as much, but they are on all the edges of our fields um, where we are, you know, needing weeding. We, they're an incredible insect control um, they do, they often will go into our orchards during um, t- down times in the orchards where they can be eating cover crops. Um, so the animals are really an important part of our sort of goal of this huge diversity on the farm. 
I know that one of the challenges we had with the with the livestock on my on my own farm, which was which was a much smaller operation than than what you've got, large for some people. You know, we had twenty acres of vegetables, um, and and we had a couple hundred laying hens and a couple dozen sheep. But was that it? It was always hard to get enough uh, attention focused on them. And I think this must be one of the things about you, about the scale of your operation is that you've clearly got staff that are that are dedicated to paying attention to the sheep and dedicated to paying attention to the laying hens, right? Oh yeah, I mean we have um, we have a full time. Uh, I call him Shepherd. Um, Antonio does all of our our fence moving, um, which is you know kind of a full time job in the summer because the sheep will need to be moved every three days. Um, so we move them into a field, they, they eat it down. Um, we have about 80, um, ewes who then give birth to about 150 lambs every year. So, um, you know, that, that fence has to get moved and also has to get, get, you know, have a good charge on it so they don't get out and predators don't get in. Um, and moving that we also keep our, our, poultry in the electric fencing as well. Um, so, you know, we do a lot of moving fences. Um, so we do have a full-time person doing that. Um, and then we also have several other people that are working full-time with all the egg collection, washing the eggs, um, getting them ready for market. So, yeah, we do have a great staff that loves the animal component of the farm. You really have to love it. You have to be really passionate about that part because, if, you know, animals need a lot of TLC. So um, we look for people that have that you know, sort of in, in bread in them that um, really want to be working with animals. And it sounds like you've done the same thing with the cut flower operation that, uh, that your daughter's really focused on that right now. Is she also heading up the, the, the wholesale and the CSA portions of the cut flowers, or is she more just focused on the, on the event side, the side of things with that? I do a lot of the field part of the flowers, deciding what we're growing, where they're going to go, when planted, and all of that stuff. So I'm sort of heading up the production end of the flowers. Um, and, and then I do a lot of the sales of the wholesale flowers. But So Hannah really um, has taken uh, this new step of, of sort of full belly floral is what she loves to call it. And, and um, so she this year has right now, I think she's up, she has 27 weddings that she's doing. So her summer is completely booked every weekend, um, you know, doing uh, event coordination for these uh, and event floral arrangements and bridal bouquets and boutonnieres and things like that for all these weddings that she has booked. Uh, so that's really her focus. Um, I love the growing end of the flowers, but uh, I would never be good at making a bridal bouquet. So <laughs> she's sort of the artist um, uh, side of it, and I'm the production side. So, yeah, we I have a great, uh, great synergy. Um, you know, what's so exciting about having your kids come back to, especially Hannah and I, um, have a great relationship. She's encouraging me to grow more flowers, different kinds of flowers that I, that I would have maybe, um, just as a wholesale kind of person. Um, so she's really getting me excited about growing more perennials, um, and, you know, other things, greenery that she needs for the floral end of things, which has made it really exciting for me. The flowers are, um, are really an interesting part. We sort of started with them as just a little garden. Um, and then I started both bunching flowers and bringing them to the farmer's market. And then they sold really well. And so we sort of leapt up to a couple acres. And now, you know, we're up to like 10 acres or more of flowers. They've jumped from being kind of just, oh, Drew, grow some flowers to, oh, Drew, grow a lot of 
flowers um, <laughs> because they are now our number three crop on the farm um, as far as income goes. So, you know, it's really fun for me um, speaking of, you know, as a woman and uh, sort of having developed a part of the farm that really kind of I can take ownership with. Uh, it's been so great for me to learn about the flowers, to really be proud of the fact that they've become such an important part of our of our farm. It's just great when out in our packing shed, when we're loading trucks at night, you know, it's not just square boxes of vegetables. There's beautiful flower bouquets that are going out to stores, to restaurants, to our CSA members. So not only, you know, is it beautiful for our customers, but also for us um, on this end, we just are always just so amazed how beautiful it is. Are those going out in in buckets then, buckets of water? Yep, they go out in buckets of water. For wholesaling, we do box them. We do have floral boxes. But for our stores that we deliver directly to, um, we can just bring them in reusable boxes and just unload them in the buckets at the store. So, um, you know, they're they're pretty pretty versatile that way and um, just so beautiful. <laughs> the flowers are a lot of fun. I, it, again, it was one of those things we did. We did a lot of flowers for several years at Rock Spring Farm, and they were such a challenge to keep them going with all of the other activities that we had on the farm. I think because we had, you know, our management was spread so thin. Again, the chickens and the and the sheep and the vegetables and the herbs, and then oh, and then you have the flowers oh. on top of that. <laughs> I think having you know having those those people and I, I I just I'm gonna come back to this idea of your partnership and this this ownership structure that you've got that allows you to have a lot of people who really are have their eye on the ball at a very high level. Yeah, um, you know, I have a, a group of women, of five women who work with me full time on the flowers. So, I mean, I'm pretty spoiled. Uh, they do all the picking, uh, they do all the bunching. Um, so. I mean, there's days where we are, we're bunching 700, 800 bunches of flowers every day. So, um, you know, they're an amazing, amazing group of, of very artistic um, women who not only are, you know, are help in the field, but also in the, in the packing shed are doing a lot of the most beautiful bouquets. So um, they're helping out a tremendous amount. Um, every day in the field with the flowers. So now, Drew, I know that one other thing that Full Belly Farm does is puts on this this hose down harvest <laughs> festival every fall, which is sort of this. I mean, for me, it's kind of this mythical event. I've I've always sort of known about it, but it sounds like this. It sounds like a really great party. It is such a great party, and um, but I also want to say, so uh, one thing, I, I, you know, Full Belly Farm, we do a ton of community uh, events. Uh, we're very, very involved with community uh, here in our valley, but also just in the whole, whole agricultural community in California. Um, but So the Hose Down started um, as a, a, a fundraiser for a group called Eco Farm, um, and they put on the big conference here in California every January. And um, I'm on the board of directors of that organization, and so we started this small party. The first year was about 200 people, um, and it's grown. It, this will be, I think this will be our 29th annual um, event this October. It's held the first week in, uh, weekend in October every year. And now we're up to 5,000 people that attend. And it's really become quite an event. Um, over the years, we've raised a lot of millions of dollars. Um, and so the whole event is actually a fundraiser. Uh, Full Belly doesn't gain anything except for um, a lot of work out of the event <laughs> and some publicity, I suppose. But, um, you know, we, we have music, we've got crafts, we've got workshops, we do tours of our farm. 
a lot of animal petting zoos, etc. So it's become quite an amazing event. And um, it, but really, the main mission of it is um, as a fundraiser for now not only um, the Eco Farm. Uh, nonprofit group, but also some of our local uh, 4-H and FSA are able to also gain some of the um, profits of the far- of the event too. So we we give out a scholarship to our local high school um, ag students. So it's really a, become a, a wonderful um, and really meaningful as far as um, fundraising for a lot of nonprofits in our area. It kind of goes back to something I talked to Emily about last last week, which was Emily Oakley, who used to work for you guys, that it's something I think it's, that's really great about the organic farming community. It's like you take these people that are already working 16 hours a day, 52 weeks of the year, and, and you go like, okay, what else can we do? Oh, yeah, I think I'll go be on the board of directors of Eco Farm. Oh, yeah, and by the way, we'll throw this multi-million dollar fundraiser for them, you know, because, you know, we don't have enough on our plate. Yeah, I mean, well, I honestly want to say if we didn't do it, our farm would never get cleaned up as beautifully as it does. So it's (laughs) it's also a great um, motivator for us to make the farm really beautiful because we have so many visitors that day. Um, So so that's another little um, sort of secret goal of having an event at your farm is that it does make you want to make it really beautiful. Um, But yeah, no, we just, we're all a little bit nuts that way. um, And we feel really dedicated to, you know, helping out in the nonprofit sector of agriculture as well. Uh, Judith, our partner, is really active with a, a nonprofit organization called uh, California Association of Family Farms, um, uh, other partners involved with the Farmers Market Association. Uh, my husband's really involved with our local land trust. So we're all um, we're all a little bit crazy that way too. I know farmers tend to be that way. So. <laughs> With that, Drew, let's turn to our lightning round, and I'd like to ask you, what's your favorite tool on the farm? Oh, my gosh. My favorite tool is a digging fork, and probably that's such a classic uh, answer that you get, but I do. I, I love digging um Believe it or not, I I love gardening. It's one of my passions. Um, even though we have this amazing farm, um, I love having a, a, a garden around my house. So I do a lot of um, gardening just around in in a smaller space because that makes me feel really good. So I have I love digging digging forks. Yep. <laughs> So the garden around your house, what do you grow? Oh, it's all flowers, Chris. Yep. Okay. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I remember one of the funny things about, about being a flower farmer is that a lot of times you actually don't see all of the color, you oh, know, because I you're harvesting know. them early. So. I think having those flowers around your house really does give you that opportunity. Yeah, I love letting a little patch of zinnias go all the way. Just let them go because usually we're picking them when they're you know not all the way open. So it is fun. Yep. <laughs> Great. And what's the last book that you read? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> well, oh, oh gosh, I have one right in front of me called Beautiful Sheep. Um, that I <laughs> just, <laughs> <laughs> I, I love reading. I'm sort of a nerd about reading about animal books. So, um, yep, that's a good one. It's got lots of photographs of all these really funny looking sheep. So <laughs> that's one that I have. <laughs> that's great. Um, and what's the best advice you have ever gotten? Oh, gosh. I was just thinking about th- that this morning. Um, I feel like the best advice is to just make sure that you actually appreciate where you live. Um, I think a lot of us farmers are so head down, nose to the grindstone that we don't look up very often and, you know, look at the stars or look around us. So I think just making sure that you appreciate where you live. Um, yeah, that was good advice. What What do you appreciate most about where you live there in the Cape Valley? 
Oh, I wish you could look out this window with me right now. It's so beautiful. We have, we're surrounded by um, hills on both sides in this gorgeous little valley. It's green. Um, I, I would just really say the natural wonders. Yeah, I mean, we have the most amazing sky at night um, that I, you know, we're kind of on, in a dark zone and it's so beautiful. So just, just sort of all the wonderful things around us. Yeah. <laughs> And anything that you're planning on doing differently on the farm this year than you did last year? <laughs> um, yeah, I would just say trying to work a little bit less and enjoying things a little bit more. Um, you know, we work really hard, and I hope to take a little bit more time to enjoy things. So, yeah. Great. You got to get something on the calendar. I think that's the only way to make that happen. That's when you're, right. When you're kind of in that overwork mode. <laughs> that's good. That's good advice right there. <laughs> All right. And finally, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? I would tell myself that it's all going to be okay, that we do a lot of worrying. Um, we do, you know, we, we worry extraordinarily as farmers about weather, about all these things. And I would just say, it's going to be okay. It's all, all going to work out. <laughs> Drew, thank you so much for joining us on the Farmer to Farmer podcast today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been a really fun conversation. All right, so wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 57 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast, and you can find the notes for this show at farmertofarmerpodcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Rivers. That's R-I-V-E-R-S. If you enjoy the podcast, I'll bet you enjoy my weekly email newsletter, The Flying Rutabaga. You can check that out at farmertofarmerpodcast.com or purplepitchfork.com. Also, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review if you enjoy the show. Or talk to us in the show notes. Tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on the book. Your reviews and your referrals make a huge difference in our ability to reach out to an ever-growing circle of listeners. And one more thing. I appreciate so much all of the great guest suggestions I received through the contact form on the farmer to farmer podcastcom Please let me know who you would like to hear from, and I'll do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there. Keep the tractor running.